Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, I have one o'clock. Uh, good morning to everyone from the 36th Caller Lab Convention. Today is April the 6th, 2009. This is a session on war stories. I'm Elmer Sheffield. I'm going to be your uh, MC for today. Skip Brown was supposed to do this, but his mother-in-law became very ill, and he had to leave and go home, and, and she she is very ill. That's what we hear. So uh, I just got handed this and said, hey, would you would you handle this? Uh, and, and, f and to be honest with you, I, from, my, from what I understand, this is supposed to be a session where we just kind of informally uh, talk about things that have that have taken place uh, in our, uh, I suppose, our square dancing lives over the years, and that are that are maybe humorous and maybe not humorous. But we'll listen to whatever you have. The, the session is is being taped, so I'll need you to to take the microphone if you want to say something. Okay. Um, someone said, "Well, why don't you uh, why don't you start off by by telling." something and and uh i never kept up with them to be honest with you but one thing that really has always stuck in my mind and and i tell it every time i get a chance is back in my my days when i was uh really traveling a lot uh, almost every weekend i got a letter uh, from from a place called and don't laugh if you've been there but i a place called noxapater Mississippi, and they wanted me to do their their special. Uh, it's an afternoon workshop and a Saturday night dance, and um, they asked, they give me the date and they want to know was I available and, and my fee. And uh, I wrote them back, and sure enough, they hired me. So I, I had a couple in the local club that wanted to go with me to, on to that dance. So we, I said, fine. And so we got in the car, and we headed for Noxapater, Mississippi, to, to the Coliseum. Well, of course, I envisioned uh, a, a big civic center or a Coliseum or something that, that would ha we would have, uh, you know, 75 to 100 squares. But like in, in those days was kind of common. So we got, we drove from Tallahassee to Noxapater, and we got there, and I and right away I could see this was not a metropolis; it was a uh, a very small town in the country. And so I stopped at the station, and I asked the guy if he knew where the come on in, John, if he knew where the Noxapater Coliseum was, and. Uh, he kind of looked at me. I, I mean, I could have probably asked for most anything and, and got the same reaction. But anyway, I finally get around to tell him, well, I, I'm supposed to be calling the square dance here tonight. He said, oh, oh, yeah. He said, I know where that is. He said, you go down about two blocks, turn right, go down one block, turn right again. You'll see it. So I'm still looking around, you know, thinking they've hidden this Coliseum pretty well. So I, we go down, we turn, we do this turn, and we look. <clears throat> well, guess what we saw? We saw a two-story fire station. And when I told the guy there, I said, Sir, I'm looking for the Coliseum. I'm supposed to call the dance here. He said, Oh, yeah. He said, uh, This is it. He said, Just give us, said, it'll take us about 15, 20 minutes to move these fire trucks out. They drove the fire trucks out from under this, this station and got out the brooms and swept this. Uh, little concrete area, and soon after, not too many more minutes, I had four squares of dancers show up, and that was the Noxapater Coliseum, and that was one of my big dances that I did over the years, and, and I still think about it. I mean, it, it was it was just so funny because it, back then, you know, we'd go to. to uh, Montgomery, uh, Dothan, uh, Jacksonville, we'd call in the in the in the coliseums or the civic centers, and we'd have, as I said before, 7,500 squares. Nobody thought nothing about it. It was just common. So when I got this letter here again, I just I just said, well, we're going to the Coliseum in Mississippi, and, and that was it. And, uh, of course, the people had a good time, and they paid me, and I guess I couldn't complain about anything else. But, boy, I, I'm telling you, I'm still shocked, and that's been probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But anyway, I'll... Uh, I'll I'll open this up to to anybody there who would like to share 
something with us that's happened to you. John? John I'll get you, John. John Jones, uh, give us your name and everything for the tape. John Jones from Texas. And I got a lot of war stories. But there was one in particular, and if nobody else talks, then I could keep on going. But I don't want to do that, Elmer. I don't want to hog the whole show. But there's one particular story that I thought you might find interesting. A number of years ago, I was booked to come to Del Rio, Texas, to call a dance. And uh, it's not a real big town, but it's right down on the Rio Grande River and right across the river from Old Mexico. And that was in the days when I was still working, had a Monday through Friday job. And I was married to Shirley, who's Vernon's mother at the time. And we had been to Mexico on other occasions, driven in and what have you. And she had purchased a Mexican vanilla. And it is really good liquid vanilla because it's not diluted at all. It's straight, pure vanilla. And a quart bottle would last four or five years, you know, as far as using vanilla to cook with. So she knew I was going there, and she said, run across the border and get me a quart of vanilla. Okay. So I flew to San Antonio and rented a car, and I had requested a vehicle with a cruise control because that was not common on vehicles, all of them. You had to order it especially. So when I got there, they said, the only cruise control vehicle we've got came in from New Mexico. And I said, I don't care. So San Antonio was about 250 miles east of Del Rio. And there ain't nothing between San Antonio and Del Rio but the uh, the big uh, Y.O. ranch that goes all the way across through there. So I said, that's fine. I'll take that car. So I got the car and got had the lease papers and all this bit, and I took off for Del Rio. Got there and went and got me a motel, and it was about mid-afternoon. And I said, well, I'm going to run across the border and get that quarter of vanilla and get that over with, and then I don't have to worry about it. So I unload, unloaded my clothes and put them in the motel, got in the car and took off and drove across the border. You know, no problem getting in. You can just, at that time, you could just zip right on in. So I went in there, and the first little convenience store I came to, I stopped. I bought the quarter of vanilla. I turned around, and I'm coming back out. Well, there was a pretty good line of vehicles coming back out to get into the through the U.S. Customs. And all at once it dawned on me, here I am by myself. I'm in a rented vehicle with a New Mexico license plate, and I live in Texas, and I got to convince the U.S. Customs agent that all I bought was a quart, a dollar and a half quart <laughs> bottle of vanilla. That's all I got. And I said, they ain't, I said, there ain't no way they're going to believe that. And uh, so when I finally got up there and I explained to the guy what I had, and he looked at it and he said, pull over there. And I thought, oh, boy, I've had it now. Well, a little while an agent came out and he quizzed me like you wouldn't believe. Now, those, the border Patrol people have more authority than any other law enforcement agency in the country, at least in the United States they do. And they can rip your automobile to shreds and walk off and leave it sitting there and not owe you a dime. And I've seen them do it. I've seen them take axes and knives and everything imaginable and tear a vehicle all to pieces and leave it sitting there. And... He said, hold on just a little bit. And I thought, oh, no, what have I got to do now? And and I was getting worried because he had looked in the trunk. They had looked underneath the car with mirrors and everything else. In a little while, there was a lady came out, and she said, I'm his supervisor. Tell me your story. And I said, I've already told him. And uh, she said, well, tell me. And I said, gave her my ID, told her what I had done. I was in Del Rio to call a square dance, and that's the only thing I'm doing. I said, all I bought was for my wife this dollar and a half bottle, quart bottle of vanilla. I said, you can take the thing and bust it if you want to. I don't care. I just need to go so I can call that square dance tonight. She said, get out of your car and come with me. <laughs> and they can do anything they want to with you practically, at least for about a week. 
went into their office and walked over near her desk, and she raised up a paper that was laying on a table like this, and she said, here's the cake you're having at your dance tonight. <laughs> it had the Square Dance Club's name on it, Welcome John Jones. And that saved my bacon, I guarantee you. And, and she said, and there's the lady that made it sitting right there. She said, have a good time. Bye. Don. Don Beck from Martha's Vineyard, an island off the coast of Massachusetts. And I wasn't planning to say anything, but I couldn't resist the opportunity at this point. Um, Back in the late 60s or early 70s, I went to a caller school in Colorado. Staff was um, Earl Johnston, Frank Lane, and they had a few guest staff like Burl Maine and uh, Jerry Haig and uh, Vaughn Parrish and an awful lot of students. It was a big crowd. I didn't know schools didn't always have that many. And, and some of the people that were part of the students were Greg Anderson and... and uh, Jack Murtha, et cetera. <laughs> Had a great time, learned a lot, went back home, and I can't remember if it was a month or two later or a year or two later or what have you, um, listening to Handhurst tape, new record on Red Boot that... That's my chair. <laughs> <laughs> new record on Red Boot, and they announced the name of the guy. He says, that name sounds familiar. And I went looking through my picture of the caller school, and there, oh, yeah, that was the quiet guy that was always in back. And his wife, Margie, <laughs> it was my friend Elmer here. <laughs> Made a lot of good friends at that meeting. <laughs> yes, I remember that. We, we uh, Margie and I went to that caller school, Frank Lane's up in the mountains, I guess. But it, be, we, stayed in a, we stayed in a tent. We'd never been in a tent in our life. And I, when I say a tent, folks, I'm not talking about one that you can get up and walk around in. This was a tent. And it rained the whole time we was there. Mud all over everywhere. The, 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 and, and all of a sudden, we saw these little animals. Uh, chip, what were they? Chipmunks? Marge was ready to go home. Because them things were running all over. The, then we decided we wanted to catch one and take it home. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it, that was it was a very good experience. And we, as he named off the people who were there teaching, obviously we uh, we learned a lot. Well, I remember the guy you, you, you mentioned. I was the quietest one. I remember the one who was the loudest, and that was Barry Medford, if you remember. <laughs> Super duper little caller had a great, great singing voice and all, but he had a lots and lots of ego, yeah. <laughs> and I think that may be what killed him. Anyway, what year was it, Don? I, Don, I don't remember. Sixties. So yeah, I, I don't remember either. I, I know I couldn't call square dances. And, but I tell you right quick, hang on just a second. Right quick about the record deal the thing. I'll just tell you all this quick story. Uh, when I came home, uh, I was a singing caller. I was a singing caller. I could call a little bit of patter if, if you really pressed me. Mostly like circle left and alaman left, right and left, grand, swinging promenade home. But uh, no, I knew a little more than that. But anyway, uh I just happened to make the connection with Don Williamson with Red Boot, and I don't know, you folks are not as old as I am, but if you were, you'd remember, you would remember, ain't, uh, uh, good morning, country rain, Monday morning secretary, bandy the rodeo clown, ain't love a good thing. I mean, just, and anyway, it put me on the map as a caller, and all of a sudden I started getting these letters saying, we want you to come to California and do our so-and-so. We want you to come to Texas. And, do, and I'm saying, man, I can't call. I can't go out there and sing for two days. So I had to, I had to start learning how to call. And I went and spent three days with Jack Lassery. And, and make a long story short, he, he kind of helped me get started. And then I learned to call two patter figures. 
There's, I'm not, I'm just touching, you know, you fiddle. Uh, there's, oh, I'm George. No, I'm not either. Bob Rollins. Uh, there's about three of them that I can think of. Uh, uh, the one with Chris Veer, there's, uh, there's one with, uh, with, uh, that other old guy, uh, Cal Golden. But the one that I remember the most was the one in Hawaii. I had just gotten there and, uh, they had hired me to call be their caller uh, at the uh, Hickam uh, Air Force Base. And uh, I got a phone call at home from Trish Bonwig. I'm not supposed to say the names, but I remember her name it's distinctly. She was the president of the club. And she said, Admiral Crow's um, aide wanted the square dancers to come down and dance for uh, the president of Bangladesh, who wants to see modern American dancing. And I said, okay. So I come there. Uh, they tell me where to park. I walk over, and they won't let me go near the house because I'm like hired help, I guess. I don't know. And uh, I went, the, there's Trish, and there's all the square dancers whom I have never met before. But I knew Trish, Trish Bonwick, and I knew they could call and everything. And I knew Admiral Crow was from Oklahoma. So the first thing I did was have the perfect singing call for when we were going to do that, you know. Ain't nothing like an Oklahoma morning. And I figured if I did something really bad, I'd save my bacon. But I, I, she told me, she said, I'll introduce you and you can introduce the square dancers. And I said, how about if you introduce me and I'll introduce Trish Bonwick and she can introduce the square dancers because she's the president. Well, you have to remember now, this is back, we well, don't have to remember anything, but this is back in the 80s and women in Bangladesh, didn't have the same uh, level of, of, of uh, importance that a man did. And it was kind of, I wasn't thinking that. All I was thinking was that you're an admiral and I'm in civilian clothes. You're not telling me what to do. <laughs> so they introduced me. I introduced Trish Bonwick and uh, she introduced the square dancers. I went ahead and called. Uh, everybody, everything went fine. And evidently up there where they were sitting, there was a conversation going on because he, Admiral Crow had about 20,000 pounds of torque on his jaws when I did what I did because I was told to do something and I didn't do it. And uh, his wife came down and said something, Marine, huh? Looks like you need a haircut. And she, he hit her. Admiral Crow hit his wife. Boom, just like that in the shoulder like that and I'm I'm causing a riot and I didn't mean to you know at the same time the president of Bangladesh come down and he said well son he says I'll tell you something you did a fantastic job you can come to my country anytime you want and I said Phew, like that and then two weeks later he was killed in an airplane crash thing so but it's weird you don't have to be a world renowned caller to have things happen to you they happen at home all the time so all righty, come forward. I'll just state uh, Trey Hutchison, the general chairman of the 58th National in Long Beach. In preparation of us uh, putting together our convention, um, my wife and I had the pleasure of being the chairman of the state convention, and it was held on the Queen Mary. Um, and people wondered, well, where are they going to dance on the Queen Mary? Well, they didn't realize they took the engines out and the boilers out, and we had a three-tier uh, area they called their exhibit halls. Well, off of one of those exhibit halls was a spot known as the boiler room. It had the best wood floor that you would ever want to see, except it was down in the bowels of the ship where you had the, the metal... Uh, sides of the ship, and we decided to have a fundraiser for this convention uh, by having a dance in the boiler room. You do one tip, one tip only, and we had dangles made up to give to people. We had 200 dangles made up. We collected $300. It became a very uh, thing to do by going into the uh, boiler room, and it was just one tip, and people wanted to get that dangle and have that experience on this beautiful wood floor. Um, one gal came in with a baby uh, slung on herself because she wanted that dangle for that child to show off in future years. Um, while we were down there, 
uh, our assistant at the time and did a nice job. He stole our bed. So we had no bed when we got back up to our stateroom. And that came back the next morning out into the, the passageway at the Queen, and that's where my wife decided to sleep in the morning at 5 a.m. because the bed was there. They wanted to take the bed down to where we were dancing, and we had a uh, set up for the dance hall to be on two levels with one collar on one level. So they danced on the second level and the bottom level with one collar. And they wanted to bring the bed down on Sunday morning for Sunday morning madness, but they didn't uh, couldn't get it in the elevator because the elevator was too small. And when the security found out about this later, they said, well, why don't you call us? We would have taken you a different way and gotten the bed down there. This, yeah, my name's Lynn Webster from the Twins. It's part of more of an exciting story. Last year I was at Nationals in, in Kansas City, and there was an opening in the C1, intro to C1. And I said, well, I can take that opening. You know, I'm not doing anything. So I looked at who was doing it before me and after me. It was Jerry Story and Mike Jacobs. And I'm like, oh, my God. So then I had my sing call record or my patter record that I was going to use for patter all picked up for this. And I looked down the top of it. Jerry Story had done it. So that's my story. <laughs> he did it on purpose. I think <laughs> Who wants to be next? Who said that? Yeah, nobody joined. Uh, going along with what uh, the gentleman was up here, Bob. Oh, Cappy Kaplan, Seattle, Washington. You don't have to be known to end up in strange places. I got a phone call from Bob Ruff's son down in California. He says, we're doing a private party. Come down and call it. That's all he told me. So I go down there, and I got down there. I had to give them my Social Security number, my driver's license. We were going to do a private party for a nine-year-old kid, a little girl. So the limousine picked us up and took us up there. We went to security again. They invited 700 families to this birthday party. There were 2,000 people there. For three hours, we rotated five basics of people across the floor, five basics of people across the floor. So you don't have to be like John Jones or... or that kid over there, what's his name? Uh, 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 Vic, Vic, Vic Cedar. Anybody, it's just a draw the hat. It's just a draw the hat. All right. Come on up here, John. I know you got, John K., I know you got some stories to tell. Yeah. My name is John Colton Teller in Pocono Pines. Mine is not a really fantastic story, but it's kind of an interesting one from the standpoint that as we do things in our score dance careers, we have a variety of circumstances. And I was calling a demo dance at a nursing center. After it was all over, one of the nurses came up and said, that was a great demo. Nobody fell asleep. <laughs> they had you back. All righty. Don't hold back. I know everyone here has had something happen. Come on forward, Wayne. <laughs> yeah, don't tell some of them. Huh? Some I can't tell. I'm Wayne Nicholson from L.A. That's lower Alabama, Montgomery. <laughs> you, tell, you should tell some scary things that happened to you. I retired from the Air Force in uh in 1961, I was in Korea, and I taught two nights a week at the service club at Osan, K-55. And on Friday nights, they had at the Seoul Area Command in Seoul, they had a, a big square dance there, one-night stand type thing. Uh, Leo Barnell and Bob Johnson were from, I think, in Chicago area somewhere. They... Uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture helping the Korean farmers get back after the Korean War. But anyway, on Saturday nights, the USO would take a bunch of these Korean girls and we'd go up on the DMZ in the tents they had up there and the Army guys, uh, we'd put a, a dance on. We'd dance some sawdust in the big old tents 
and right on the 38th parallel. And right in the middle of the dance, uh, from the North Korean side, you heard, uh, hope you square dancers are having fun to Wayne Nicholson and Leo Barnell. And that was a time we had all these uh, killings and everything else. But that was kind of scary. How the intelligence, they knew that we were there. All righty. Who wants to be next? Don't hold back. Step forward. I know someone here has got an experience that they just are dying to share with us. There he comes right there. Mike Turner, Wichita, Kansas. <clears throat> this is sort of a story of how you happen to meet people in the square dance world. Um, being from Wichita, we have McConnell Air Force Base. And they had a very nice club out there, and uh, a friend of mine danced out there. We, being single at the time, we used to dance together with a lot of the same girls and all. And so this gentleman, we're not supposed to use names, right? Uh, this gentleman got transferred to South Carolina, and I didn't figure I'd ever see him again until this particular national convention in Kansas City in 1975, which was about three years subsequent. And at the time, we were, my partner and I were walking from the municipal auditorium over to the Muehlbach Hotel. That happened to be the year that they did not get their convention center done on time. Therefore, they had uh, several different venues in Kansas City that they had to use uh, in lieu of one large convention center. So people who have nice convention centers should feel very blessed that they do have a nice convention center. But making this longer story shorter, uh, we were about halfway across the street, and who should show up but my friend along with two girls and another gentleman. And he introduced this gentleman uh, and we were standing there talking in the middle of the street with cars going by on both sides of us. And he finally says, hey, he says, this gentleman's getting ready to call over at the municipal auditorium in the basement. And we, said, well, we just came from there. He says, well, you, you need to come along and dance to him. So we went and we danced and, uh, and he did an exceptional job. And I was, I was quite impressed with the fact that not only could he belt out a song, but he threw a little theatrics and then he got down on his knees to sing the song. And I thought, okay, that's cool. After it was all over, the Century Book people show up and there were they were lined up behind the stage all the way down the side of the hall and halfway across the back. I thought to myself, obviously these folks were impressed with this gentleman's performance. So I was kind of hanging around on the sidelines, and this gentleman was signing all of the century books. Finally, they all got through, and Marshall Flippo pulled him aside and says, Hey, he says, I heard you say that you were going to book some festivals. He says, You don't even do patter yet, do you? And he looked at me and says, Well, no, he says, that's three years off. I'll learn. It was Tony Oxendine. Oh, yeah. I, he mentioned Marshall uh, back in his 70s, I guess it was. Uh, Marshall was my idol, I guess. I, I mean, and, and I guess he still is. I, he, he's just a great, great caller and a great guy and full of crap. But uh, my, my club at home decided to have a special dance they booked the elks club which had a real nice hall and and i was to call the dance and and you know how you through the years i'm sure you've had times when when people plan surprise parties for birthday parties for you and you usually knew it even though you pretended you didn't but i'm in all honesty i had no idea what was going on except that we were having this big dance and there were people coming in from out of town and I was going to be the caller and they, it, it was a it was like you, your clubs have had uh, appreciation dances maybe for you well that's what this was but anyway 
they, we, we got it got time for the dance, and I got up and I put the the uh, the patter record on and, and you know began to get the floor up, and everybody was enthusiastic. And they said, "Hold on for a minute." And they wheeled in this refrigerator box. This is no joke. This is just honest. They wheeled in this refrigerator box. And I'm thinking, what the heck's going on here, you know? And they said, open that box up. I lifted the lid, and sitting in there on the chair was Marshall Flippo. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, damn, I'm glad you finally let me out. He said, I've been in here for two days. <laughs> but, they, you know, they had they had actually paid him, flew him in there, whatever you want to call Did the whole ball of wax to have him call that dance that was an appreciated dance for me. And, I, I you know, it was just a thrill because – he and I were friends, but uh, you know, I did. I rarely got to see him, but it was really great. Really. Anyway, who wants to be the next victim here? Now we don't want to have to pry it out of you because we know that you got stories you want to tell. I got lots of them I can tell, but some of them I can't tell. But but uh, some of them I could tell. Like the time I went, the first time I went to Japan, and. Uh, as Don said a while ago, I, I have never been gifted with uh, a real outgoing personality. I mean, I, I apologize for that, but I'm just kind of laid back, and that's just me. But I got to Japan, and uh, then people couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Japan. So uh, they, they finally told me, well, they understand square dance terminology. You know, just if you say head square through they'll the heads will square through but they said don't waste your time making smart cracks or jokes or uh, which i didn't but the first tip uh big drops of sweat was running down under my arms i had no idea where the corner was because they all looked just alike <laughs> and I, i'm just struggling but anyway i get through finally and i said <laughs> Okay, everybody, rest. We'll be back. Let people still stand there looking up at me, you know. And I said, I said, you know, it's rest time. He's still looking up there at me. So Takozaki, who, who speaks both, came up and he said, you have to say kuke. And they and so I said, kuke. Ah, oh, they all left the floor. I mean, but but uh, uh, thank goodness it, it went uphill from there. I mean, we... we we got on the same plane, and, and you know, uh, once I relaxed and found out they were just square dancers like everybody else, and and uh, and they could really dance. They could probably dance a lot better than I could call anyway. So we got on a pretty good level and had had a lot of fun. Went back, I think, a total of four times to Japan. So I, I always felt like if somebody books you the first time, you're probably lucky. If they book book you back the second time they must have liked something that you did and the third or fourth time you're either going too cheap or they really like you so, so come on forward don don beck again this is just short but language barrier stuff i found it entertaining and, and educational um I was in the Czech Republic once. I think it was, yeah, it was still Czechoslovakia. It was before the curtain fell, the re before the revolution. Um, I've been there many times before and since because I have relatives there. Um, but we had looked up some square dancers. It was before the modern Czech movement had started, but there were still quite a few and called a small dance. And, and then we went out to visit a bigger festival they were having that weekend. And they asked me to call a tip and, uh, calling along fine, and all of a sudden, you know, swing through, men run, the floor froze. Nobody moved. What are we doing? And then I heard a whisper over there, boys run. <laughs> and then that whisper spread to everybody, boys run, boys run. And, and they learned that men run and boys run meant the same thing, whatever that was. And then I could proceed calling all this while. Well, but, you know, where I sometimes get insistent on using men and women for the men and women that are dancing for me rather than boys and girls. Um, it just didn't go over cross-language kind of thing. It was an education. Yes. All righty. Someone step forward and tell us a good story. I know you got them. I know John has a bunch of them. I mean, I've, I've known John for 100 years. He's... 
he could entertain us all for the rest of this period. And there's one of them just came in the door back there. <laughs> I'm John Jones again. And like I said, I, I, I guess I could sit here and tell stories forever because the, every time somebody mentions something, it reminds me of something else. And Elmer mentioned Japan, and my first trip to Japan, we flew into uh, Tokyo and was met by a Japanese lady square dancer that could speak English and so we immediately got on a train and went straight across Japan to Osaka which is on the far west side and that train would run nearly 300 miles an hour and uh, power poles along beside the railroad track looked like fence posts here in the country in our country it was going so fast and it goes into Osaka and it doesn't turn around they got an engine on each end. It looks the same on each end. They turn the seats around, and you go back the other way. And we were met in Osaka and taken to a hotel and told what time we would be picked up. The square dance started at 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Went to the dance, walked in, and the sound is set up in the whole bit. And they were all women. They all had on beautiful square dance costumes. And I was a, I helped teach Elmer Sheffield how to sight call. <laughs> and in those early days of Elmer, he came through uh, Fontana and he said, John, I need to learn how to sight call. <laughs> and so every moment we had, we were working with Elmer to teach him what sight calling was. And, of course, I was almost a pure sight caller at that time in Japan. Well, I couldn't find a partner, much less corner, Elmer. Good Lord, it was unbelievable. I reverted to memory. My early days of calling, we all learned everything, total memory. From bow to your partner to bow to your partner was a memorized routine. So I started thinking back to those things that I knew from memory, and it was enough to do two tips. <laughs> And from then on, I kept, my memory went blank. Well, during the first tip, I'm concentrating really hard on a couple of squares down front. And I finally got to where I could tell them apart, at least by dress color. Then when we took a break and squared up again, they changed partners and swapped sides and got in a different square. I had to start all over again. You know, I'm working memory, but I'm trying to memorize the people so I could sight call the rest of the evening. After the second tip, I asked him, I said, why did you dance start so early? Well, uh, it's because the ladies have to get home and fix dinner for their husband. We have to get the dance over with before the husbands come home because they commute a long way to work. And I said, why are there no men here? And they said, men are too busy. Uh, they, they're too busy. They work all day long, and they work till 8 o'clock at night, and they don't have time to square dance. So it's all women. And the the caller was a lady. And they were extremely nice to us, but they couldn't speak English, the, only the one lady. And after the second tip, Michelle Osawa showed up with three other men and apologized for being late because they'd been hung up in traffic and couldn't get there. But they came, and they each got a partner, and they danced the same position with the same partner the rest of the evening because they knew we were sight callers, uh, or I was. And uh, so I made it the rest of the time. Well, it was really neat that uh, about half of those ladies followed me back across to the other side of Japan to the festival that we did over there, and I wound up dancing in the square with them. Uh, on the floor, and they were just thrilled to death that I would get out there and dance with them. But that was my first experience in Japan. But it, it, it's been really neat. And you can't say centers turn around in Japan, just like Don was saying over in the Czech Republic. You better say you turn back or they won't do anything. You've got to call the calls exactly like they're written on the sheet. And and so uh, that's those are other stories. I've been all over the USSR doing a cultural dance exchange with the uh, USSR and Russian Dancers Association and great experience with people that don't speak English and how do you teach square dancing to people who don't speak English ain't nothing to it I learned a long time ago from a 
professional caller, Joe Lewis from down in Dallas, how to teach people how to do square dance. And you can entertain them for two hours and never teach them a darn thing except where their home position is. And, and it's really, really easy to do. One of the stories that I was going to tell involves a couple of others, Elmer, if I may indulge the time. And it deals with customs again. And this time, Canadian customs. And I did a Square Dance Institute in Banff, Alberta, Canada for about 10 years, working with Manning and Nita Smith. And the second year I was there, and I've never seen such dancing participation in all my life. The, the week was always sold out. It was a week-long situation. There were 20 squares of dancers. They danced every square and every round and never missed anything. And we danced for five days that way. I could not believe such participation. Anyway, the second year we went in there, in the middle of the week, there were two Canadian customs agents showed up, and they said, we need to see Manning Smith and John Jones. Well, you're you're dead. You go, and they said, you go to your room and you stay there and we'll be there. So they went and interviewed Manning. And about 30 minutes later, they came and interviewed me. And we wound up having to pay a fine because we didn't have a work permit. At those days, In those days, you had to have one. Johnny LeClaire was on staff that week also. He had a work permit because he was running in and out of Canada all the time. But Johnny LeClaire is one-quarter Indian, and he didn't have to have anything but his green card. Well, I didn't find out soon enough that I was an Indian so I could get one and get me a green card. Yeah. <laughs> if my parents had told me that I was part Indian, I'd have had a green card a long time ago. So anyway, we paid this fine. The following year and I went back, I told the Canadian customs agent, I said, I need a work permit. And he said, okay, go in that office. So I went in that office and a guy came in there to interview me. And he said, aren't you John Jones? And I said, yes. And he said, aren't you going to Banff to do the institute up there? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'm a square dancer here in Calgary. You don't have to have a work permit to go up there. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm not leaving this building until you or somebody else, you put your name on a piece of paper and you sign it and you put the government seal on it that I do not have to have a work permit. And he said, okay, no problem. So he wrote it out and put the stamp on it, and I went away. While we were up there that year, you never know when you're going to get checked or examined or whatever it might happen to be. So the following year, some of the callers up there asked me to bring in some equipment because they had to pay such tremendous duty to get it into Canada at that time. And it was unbelievable. So I took, and Hilton had just made the micro mini. I got two micro minis and I got four 10-inch folded horn speakers. All my luggage, all of Shirley's luggage, the whole bit. I'm dragging luggage and I'm kicking equipment and pushing it and shoving it and dragging it and finally got it all up there. And the Canadian customs agent says, what all you got? And I said, all this junk. And he said, would you hurry up and get it out of the way so these other people can get through? <laughs> Yeah, and I wasn't trying to sneak in nothing, so he said, you know, if I'd have been trying to sneak it in, he'd have probably examined everything I had. But, uh, you know, never looked at none of it. I've had them count my records and put a value on it and count them when I leave to make sure I took them all out and didn't leave any of them up there. One year when we were there, they had a Canadian pilot's airline strike and shut down everything in Canada. Well, we were driven from Calgary to Great Falls, Montana, to catch a plane to come home. Well, the people that drove us, I was driving the car, and it was a Canadian car. And the, the couple that was driving us down there, he had purchased a big paper bag full of alcohol to take to friends in Great, Great Falls. So he had a big paper bag full of quart bottles of liquor. Well, when we got down there, the customs, the U.S. customs agent told him what he was doing. He looked in the car the whole bit. There's four of us in there. He said, you got any liquor? And Mickey's sitting in the back seat right behind me. And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, why didn't you keep quiet, Mickey? He said, how much you got? He said, wait just a minute. Well, he's rumbling around. Bling, 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 bling. The bottles are rattling. And he came out and said, one bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all I could do to keep a straight face. <laughs> he said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to drink it. <laughs> he said, well, go on. We got a trail line. We went on. Got to Great Falls to catch the plane. And I ha we had put 
four of Shirley's 28-yard or 60-yard crinoline petticoats in a big cardboard box that I had. Had it wrapped up and tied with rope. Got to the U.S. Customs agent, and he said, what's in that box? And I said, petticoats. And he said, what? (laughs) I said, crinoline petticoats, square dance petticoats. He picked it up, and he said, feels kind of heavy, petticoats. I said, well, a pair of my shoes are in there. We better look at it. And I said, okay. He started to untie it. And I said, be careful pulling that lid up because when you do, I said, them things will fly out of there like a jack-in-the-box. He looked at me like I was an idiot, which they can do. <laughs> and I think about half of them are. But anyway, he pulled the lid off of that thing. And those petticoats jumped out of there, and he jumped back. And another agent over here jumped back. And I said, I told you. So he looked around in there, and he said, well, all you got is a pair of shoes in there. He said, okay, go ahead. And I said, go ahead. I said, put them things back in that box. He said, I don't have to. Well, there was about 40 people lined up behind me. He said, I don't have to. I said, I don't either. (laughs) And I didn't crack a smile. And I said, I'll stand here forever and let them people stand behind me and wait. I said, I told you what was in there, and you didn't believe me. I said, you took them out, you put them back. I said, I'll help you. But I said, you're going to help me too. Well, all right. Well, he finally did, but he wasn't very happy about it. But we got out of there. But we've had lots of experience with those kinds of things. I could tell some stories on Deborah, but I don't know. Huh? If I dare to, you want me to put it on tape? I've said it before. Anyway, yeah, you know, I've told you uh, when we when Deborah decided she wanted to be a Texan, uh, I'm still training her. But uh, we rented a Penske U-Haul or a hauler truck to haul all her junk. I mean, a stuff from California to Arlington. And uh, when we got to El Paso. She thought we were nearly home. <laughs> and it's exactly halfway between L.A. and Arlington. And it had taken us two days to get to El Paso. <laughs> so we were another two days from home. So anyway, it was right at dusk coming in on Interstate 10. Coming into Texas on the major highways, there's a big monument out, uh, the uh, outline of Texas. It says, Welcome to Texas. I pulled over the side of the road. And like I said, it was right at dusk. She says, is there a problem? I said, no. I'm going to take your photo here with this Welcome to Texas sign. Okay. So she gets out of the truck, and we went down. I took her photo, and we got back to the truck. And before she got in, I turned her around, and I hugged her, and I kissed her. And I said, welcome to Texas. She had a smile on her face, big smile. And I said, the rules have changed. I said, I'm not putting up that California crap anymore. <laughs> Didn't work, but I tried it. Uh. Oh. Deborah, you got anything you want to tell? <laughs> um. It, he, he actually did say that. Oh, I'm Deborah Carroll Jones from Arlington, Texas, and he did really say that at the border. You know, the rules have changed. So uh, a few months later, after I'd moved to Texas, John is not a morning person. And so he's a little bit crabby in the morning. Well, this morning that we got him, he was really grouchy. And I said, what is wrong with you this morning? And he said, you stole the covers all night long. So all I had was just a little scrap that went over my feet. I had nothing on the rest of me all night. He said, you never used to do that in California. What happened? I said, well, the rules have changed. <laughs> all righty. Moving right along. Who wants to be next? I, I know you, somebody else has a story out there. We got a few minutes yet, so come on. Yeah, Bob Rollins again. In 1967, I uh, was forced 
to attend a square dance class, uh, kicking and screaming. But it was one of those things where I was in a fight with my wife, and if I didn't do this, I was really in trouble. So I went. And it was supposed to be punishment for me. And uh, the second or third class, I was pulling her down to the class and, and going and learn how to square dance. And I was up in Bremerhaven, Germany at the time. Uh, and then the caller, bless his heart, I believe it was John Badenhop, uh, transferred. And when he transferred, the club was without a square dance caller. Well, I had graduated. I had attended one uh, amateur night, and I, the, the singing call that I did was on Wagon Wheel. It was King of the Road. And they said, well, let's get Bob. He's a caller. One thing I was, and I still am in my mind, uh, is a Marine. And all Marines are trained to teach. That's their, their, you know, they're just trained to teach. So you give me a lesson plan and I can teach. So I sat down and I got the sets and order book and I went ahead and I put up my lesson plans. And I said, if you guys help me, I'll take the class through. I did that. The first uh, festival that came out in Germany was down in, uh, uh, I think it was Anaheim. No, Mannheim, Mannheim, Anaheim's in California. Hey, my, my, my age, I'm catching up on it. Anyway, I went down there and uh, the European Callers and Teachers Association, I wanted to join them so I could learn more about calling. I was up there all by myself. And I walked in there and there was a fellow who was the president of the European Callers and Teachers Association. And uh, he said, well, he says, uh, we don't, we don't have anybody here that really knows you, and we haven't seen you uh, dance or call, I mean. So he said to somebody, he pointed to one of the callers and says, you take him out for this swimmer stompers badge, have him call something, and then come back and let us know. So I went out, and I, instead of pass through, I said splash through, you know. And I thought it was funny because we were all in swimming suits and, and uh, we ocean wave. That was perfect, you know. And uh, so we did all that, and, and he came back and he said, yeah, he's okay, but he needs some help. <laughs> And uh, the fellow that was the president was uh, Cal Golden. And he said, by the way, he was, a, he was an E-9 in the Air Force uh, down there. And he said, uh, well, here's the deal. Unless one of you guys wants to go up there once a quarter and train him and work with him, I suggest we go ahead and just bring him into a European College and Teachers Association, make him a member, and then we'll just ask him or require him. He said, we'll require him to attend the quarterly uh, get-togethers and dance and stuff. So he's responsible for me becoming a square dance caller. And uh, I tell that from time to time that you don't have to, uh, here again, we were saying before, you don't have to be anything really special on that, but to, to, to brush up against some of these fine, wonderful people that, uh, that do things for you. Chris Veer, real quick. Uh, the uh, Night of the Schloss in Germany, he was the feature caller up there. He had the microphone. He had a wall of square dancers. And he started out with alum and lift like an alum and wifty, count forward two, you know, go forward two and count back 50. If you think that's funny, if you think that's neat, I'm going to go have a seat. And he put his microphone down. He went down to where the coffee was. He poured himself a cup of coffee. Uh, he was talking to somebody. And out on the floor, slowly they started dropping their squares saying, what are we doing? You know, and, they st and there was one square that kept going right in front, kept going. And he pretty soon he looked at his watch and he got back up and he grabbed that microphone. And he said, let the Alaman your corner. Come on back. And he nailed it. And when he did, that whole floor started applauding for that one incident, that one event. So I had to share that. Come on, Don. Don Beck again. Or I guess I'm still Don Beck. Um, Deborah's story reminded me of another non-square dance but funny thing. Actually, mine's loosely square dance related um, in bed uh, with, with, with the covers. Um, one of my previous incarnations was an engineer. And one of the things we learned in feedback theory, uh, an example they showed us was if you take two people – with an electric blanket that's a dual control, one control works one side, one control works the other side, and switch the controls, he gets hot, so he turns the thermostat down, which makes her colder. She gets colder, so she turns the thermostat up, which makes him warmer. He gets warmer, so he turns the thermostat down, and she gets colder, and she's colder, and 
turns it up more and he gets hotter. You know, it's just because you got the cr- controls on the wrong side, the feedback is wrong, and and it's a unfortunate situation. Um, I was calling in northern Vermont, and my wife Gail was with me, and we were staying at some dancers' home. Um, and in the middle of the night, when I was starting to get colder and colder and the electric blanket thing didn't work right, <laughs> I said, oh, I know what the problem is, and I switched them. <laughs> we actually got caught in that. Um, and the next morning, we spoke with our, you know, having breakfast with our hosts, and I told them this story, just the general feedback problem kind of thing, and they thought that was cute and interesting. And I said, by the way, <laughs> did you really mean to do that to us last night? The poor people were a little embarrassed that it had happened that way, but sure enough, it does work. All righty, moving right along. Someone else, step ahead. All right. My name is Dave Geel. I'm from Cheyenne, Wyoming. And um, I call for uh, several clubs. We have a club in Laramie, Wyoming. It's called the Quadrangle Club. Um, it's a nice old building. As a matter of fact, just as a sideline, it got hit by a tornado this last year. And we just got it back together, so everything's all back together and everything's fine now. But one night we were calling, and I hadn't been calling very long, and uh, uh, I looked down and there was a confusion over in the one square, and they were all laughing and having a good time. And I thought to myself, well, what had happened? Well, the story is is that this guy was dancing along, and all of a sudden he felt some cool air and uh, noticed that his zipper was down. So he decided that he was going to zip his pants up without anybody knowing. And as he was promenading along, he reached down and zipped up his pants, and the moment he did, the woman ahead of him flipped her skirt and he zipped that dress <laughs> right into her, into that fly. Well, you think that you're going to get away with something. There's no way. So that's what happened to him. Uh, and what else? Bill Hyman, you don't have any stories? <laughs> You don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have anything? Oh, what the heck. Throw caution to the wind. Bill Hyman from Auburn, New Hampshire. I've made a fool of myself in public enough times already. So I will tell the story. I, um, in 1980, I returned from ten and a half years of living in Europe. I had started calling in 1978 under the uh, support with the support of Walt Cooley from California, and we lived in the area where John really was. John Kaltenthaler was really the key leading caller in the area, and uh, with his good graces. I was one, one night I came into his club and he knows where I'm going. I came into his club and he said, Billy, I'm sorry, you know, this club doesn't allow guest tips. Normally I would, but not in this club because they specifically don't allow that. And I said, yeah, no, that's not a problem at all. And he walked away and about 15 seconds later he came back and he said, okay, you're calling the next tip. It's the tryout for the three club class teacher slot. I had never called a tip in public. I had never called patter in public. My knees started wobbling. All of the saliva in my whole system got totally drained out through my heels. So John accompanies me up on the stage, and I said, John, you're going to have to put the needle on. You know, I I was totally nervous. I said, you do all the adjustments. I don't want to know about that. And I started off, and I went for, you know, maybe 10, 12 moves, and Peggy was dancing in the back. I it wasn't with you, but Dan- Peggy was dancing with somebody that I knew. And I just looked back there, and it just sort of felt good. And I said, ah, the man left. And the whole floor screamed, yay. I had through dumb luck, actually. Just caught it right. So the patter lasted, you know, 44 seconds or something like that. And I just, body apart, body of corners, that's done. And John came backstage and said, nice job. And I said, I didn't know where I was. That was just lucky. He said, don't 
tell a soul. Anyway, I became the caller. I became the uh, instructor at that club and eventually the club caller for one of the three clubs that was involved in that. And at the Halloween dance, the second year later, I came out. Everybody, it was, a, it was the best year of calling and the best year of that club. They had a wonderful, we didn't have a president and a vice president. We had a king and a queen. We had an exchequer. We had the executioner who would stand up on stage with a big fake hatchet sword and all that, hatchet uh, and so forth. And we had the Halloween dance, and they came in in really great costumes, and I came in just in my best Western dress. I had my best jacket on, best bolo, and I made the announcement, you know, according to the regulations at Call a Lab, we are not allowed to dress up in costumes. We have to stay professionally dressed. Yada, yada. I do the first tip. Time for the second tip. Peggy squares the floor up, and I come out, and at that time my beard was still very black, very brown, actually, and I came out in a full body suit, bunny rabbit, bunny rabbit suit with like, you know, just a cutout for the face, big floppy ears and all that. And I had white mittens on and white socks. Anyway, and they, they all laughed. It was very funny. And being the eternal, anyway, I finished, I finished the tip. It was fine. And being the total clown that I am, I went down onto the floor and sort of somewhat impolitely crashed through a crowd of my best friends out there calling, out there chatting and I had in my hand a handful of raisins, oh. and I dripped it on the floor. <laughs> and they said, Bill Hyman, what did you just do? And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And then <laughs> I bent over, and I just ate them all. Anyway, one of, one of my very proud and elegant moments. Thank you very much. All righty. Anybody else? Speak now or, or forever? Okay. All of you, come on. Hold your thought. Mary Castleberry from Joplin, Missouri, and it took me a while to think of this, but uh, I went on a trip with my husband who comes from Alabama, and we went down to visit family for a reunion, and decided to hit a dance while we were down there in Montgomery, I think, and looked it up in the uh, square dance directory, found a club that was plus, it said, and uh, went, you know, called them up and told them, you know, made sure where it was and that they were dancing and that we were going to be coming in. And we came in to dance. And, of course, I have some records in the car and, and the mic and everything. And I also cue, so they first thought I was a cure, being female, didn't realize that I was also a caller, but they did put me up to call a tip. Well, the gentleman who was calling the dance was calling some plus. It was listed as plus in the directory, so I just assume it's plus, and I just get right up there, and I just call my little plus heart out. And the dancers are doing pretty good, but they're messing up a little bit, you know, and, and I just figure, well, that's my voice and, and whatever. So then as soon as I finished my tip, which is like number three, the caller gets up and announces that the next tip will be plus. And I found out that that was in an area where the other caller group is, that some of those plus moves that I had seen them dancing were just their square dance moves. And so there I was. But the dancers were all coming over and saying, that was great. That was some neat stuff. We'd never done that before. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay. Lawrence Johnstone, Ukiah, California. About 10 years ago, I'd only been calling about five years, we used to have a festival in our area called the Pear Blossom Festival. Me being one of the local callers, they had me call in the newer dancer hall, and they brought in a fellow from about two hours away named Ben Goldberg to call in the main hall with the Ghost Riders Square Dance Band. Now, Ben was also at that time the director for an exhibition group out of um, Sacramento called the Rainbow Stars, and they were going to be doing their first exhibition under Ben at the Pear Blossom Festival that year, Saturday night. Well, Saturday night, they wanted both Ben and me to call the first tip 
in the main hall with the Ghost Riders. So the Rainbow Stars get out there before the first tip and do their exhibition. Then everybody squares up, and Ben and I get up on the stage and start calling. All of the Rainbow Stars got in the very front square. Neither Ben nor I thought anything about that until about halfway through the tip, when all of a sudden they all pull out cans of silly string and start stringing us. That wouldn't have been so bad, except somebody in the Ghost Riders also had silly string and caught us in a crossfire from behind. So here are Ben and me, these two moving lumps of silly string up there, trying to figure out what happened to us, and everybody out on on the floor, of course, is just cracking up completely. Yeah, we'll take another one. We got a few minutes yet. Still from Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> um, for many years, about seven or eight years, I wrote a, a monthly column for the Northeast Square Dance Magazine. It was called the New England Caller at the time. And it was called Shop Talk, and I'd frequently, you know, describe what the new experimental, you know, quarterly selections were or talk about anything that I wanted, and people enjoyed the off-the-wall stuff that I did. Um, and I found myself enjoying writing April, 1st, April Fool's articles for the April issue of the magazine. And one year, and it was always fun to try and think of something, but one year I came back saying, you know, and one of the things I used to write about on occasion was what Caller Lab had decided in telling the world about that. Um, I wrote that Caller Lab can't remember if I blame Caller Lab or just said the powers that be, decided that to make the level of dancing more comfortable so people would dance with people of their own ability, that we were going to be testing dancers and issuing white belts and brown belts and black belts to, depending on their <laughs> their degree of, of ability. And I was calling a dance in, in Connecticut a few weeks after that came out and heard in the cafeteria, uh, we having a refreshment break, some guy's talking to the person next to him and said, do you know what they're about to do now? <laughs> I mean, he got suckered into it, and I had to tell him it was the April issue. And people really had troubles. I, I, was, I was too vague and too convincing. Anyway, I was calling it a, a barn in Massachusetts one time, maybe three weeks after that, and by the third tip, I got everybody squared up, and it was a pretty good-sized floor. And I was about to put the needle on, and everybody reached into their pockets and pulled out these black ribbons and tied them around their, their waists. And I stood there with my mouth hanging. <laughs> they, they had actually pulled one over on me very nicely. I guess the, the club had decided to do it, and they were handing them out on the way in, and I had no idea what was coming out. Um, I wasn't planning on this, but on a related thing, because I usually had too many people believing it, I tried to be less and less, more and more obvious, less and less um, tricky as the years went on. And one year, because they still kept falling for it, six months away from April, I wrote, by the way, you know, I write these April Fuels things, and people still believe them, and I try to make it obvious. And um, So here's a warning. In six months, April's coming. That April, or a month and a half before that, when you write the article, I forgot it was the April issue. (laughs) And I didn't write an April Fool's joke, but I wrote one of my off-the-wall articles. And one of my friends came up to me afterwards, one of the dancers, and says, you know, we can't wait for the April issue. And I ran white to see what you're reading. And I said, oh, this is good. This is... He's serious. <laughs> so that was the joke that particular year is that I forgot to put one in after warning them. All righty. Anyone want to get the last word in? Come on in. Deborah Carroll Jones, Arlington, Texas. I was at a festival one time just sitting and Dancers sitting there, and this gentleman who's rather shy, he sat down next to me, and he was talking a little bit, and then he said, what's the the most bizarre thing that's ever happened to you at a square dance? And I said, wow, I'm going to have to think about that. You know, I said, what's the most bizarre thing that ever happened to you? 
And he had not been dancing that long. And he said, well, he said, I was at a dance, and the caller asked the four men to make a right-hand star. And he said, I jumped right out there, and the guy that was his opposite man jumped out there very quickly at the same time and had very long arms. And when he went to put his hand up like this to make the star, his finger went right up the other guy's nose. (laughs) I said, I think that's about the most bizarre thing I have ever heard. Bill Trelevin from Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, she just remind me of one. We had a dancer class one time up in a little town about 10, 12 miles from our place, and a bunch of great people come up there and were dancing, having lots of fun. And I was teaching dive through at the time. And some of these guys could never decide whether they're inside couple or the outside couple. And there were one fellas, they got lined up, and they went, boom, head on. Not only, on, not only on the wrong side, the one was half size shade. Finally, kind of staggered around that, and that was pretty funny. Two weeks later, the dance comes back. One of the guys comes out, football helmet on. He's ready. <laughs> no more of that stuff going on. All righty, guys. Anybody else? We're winding down here. Jerry, you got any story you want to tell us? I know you got a hundred of them. That's what I was afraid of. Come on. Mike Turner again. And actually, since I look back and saw Jerry, it did remind me of a story. Actually, actually kind of a coincidence. Um, as you probably know, many years ago, Jerry and Tony started a record label. And obviously at, at national conventions, they're pretty busy, so they, they need help in, in the booth selling records and all. And so one of, our, one of my wife's good friends volunteered to, to work in their booth. But the other lady and her husband that also worked with them had quite the unusual job, I thought, which was that uh, she was a beautician. And it wasn't that she was just any beautician. Uh, she was Jimmy Carter's barber. Anybody else want to add before we disband? Come on. The place is oh, Bob Rollins. The place is North Carolina, and it's at the at the uh, Marine Corps base there. And the club is the uh, uh, Gator Promenaders. The caller is J. L. Lemoyne. He's teaching a class. His number one man is a burly gunnery sergeant, United States Marine Corps. Rawr, you know, big guy. His corner is a little tiny girl. And he says, bow to your corner. (laughs) And then he said, yellow rock. Bow to your partner, yellow rock your corner. And that gunnery sergeant went, like that. And and she went like that. And J.L. said, what are you doing? He said, you said yellow lot. Ah, so. All righty, folks. Our time is about expired. We appreciate all of you coming out and sharing your stories with us. And I'm sure, like Jerry said, we've all got some that we'd like to tell, but we're afraid to. But uh, enjoy the rest of your day, okay?